Welcome to the media ministry of Lake Highlands Church. Please enjoy today's speaker. Well, the days come that I dreaded. I knew when I got here, I already loved this church. I knew it was going to be a really hard day for me to think about leaving. Um, but I do want you to know that when you find me sneaking back in back there so I can hear what y'all are about to get and come hear Keith, that y'all just say hi to me and I'm here to hear him and learn from. Um, I woke up last night. I found this interesting. I woke up about 10 times last night. I don't like to wake up. Okay, let's just be clear. I like to go to sleep and sleep and wake up rested, and I kept waking up, and every time I would wake up, there would be an utterance coming out of my mouth about this church, and it was awesome, and I don't have to, time to tell you all of them, but I do want to say a few things. God is pleased with you, and you can get tired of me saying that if you want, but I don't care, because he's very pleased with this body generations back. He's very pleased, and I saw the wells last night that have been dug in this place. There are many. There's not just one well. There are many places in the spirit that this church has over the generations, um, decades, been, been a huge, making a huge impact in the spirit realm. And I want you to just go further and harder and faster. In the kingdom of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the love of Jesus, and I'm excited for you. And the other thing, because there were many, but one of them that just keeps resonating to me is that the lost are coming here. The lost are coming here. Because the hungry and the thirsty need the grace and the love that this church has long sowed to. Long sowed. And also, they need the love that's here, and they need the kingdom of God, and you have it, and you know it, and I'm gonna make you one promise, and I only want one promise back. I am gonna keep living the kingdom. I am gonna keep going back and reminding myself that there's two kingdoms, and that today, when I get out of my bed and I put my feet on the ground, I have a choice which one I'm going to agree with, And my decision not only impacts me personally, not only impacts my generational line, not only impacts my church, not only impacts my city, not only impacts my nation, but the nations of God and other people's lives depend on my choice in that day. And I'm going to choose the kingdom of God with all the grace that God empowers me to choose it. And then when the freaking enemy comes and tries with his accusation and judgment and condemnation, shoving my sin, my weakness, my brokenness in my face, I'm going to look at him and I'm going to say one word, Jesus. And I am going to throw off the things that he tries so valiantly to throw in front of my face and I'm going to say, Jesus, watch us and deal with it because I'm a little sassy that way. Remember, y'all know that about me. And I'm not kidding, because the blood that was shed matters in my life today, and it matters in your life today. And people need to see the demonstration of the kingdom of God manifested, walking around, speaking, loving, blessing, and it changes the atmosphere, and it changes the hearts of people. Jesus taught us that. And I am going to remember my identity in God and I am going to remember that the cross guaranteed my victory and I'm going to remember that I'm dependent on the voice of the Father and I'm gonna inquire of him and ask of him and stop my little independent life that's a joke and I am gonna get in touch with what Father God is saying, what his strategy is in any battle I'm in and I'm going to see the victory in my life. And I'm gonna believe for it. And I'm gonna keep believing. And I'm gonna keep believing. And I'm gonna keep believing, not in me, not in my ability, not in my smartness, but in the character of my God. And I'm not gonna stop because God doesn't lose. He wins. He wins every time. He wins every time.
And I'm gonna believe until I see the grapes on the poles walking around and until my generational line stands up and says, I'll take that inheritance, thank you. I'm going to believe God. And then I'm gonna come to this one today. And this one in my life probably requires more grace than any lesson, but I can promise us today, nothing, nothing, nothing transforms the world around us, brings heaven to earth, and nothing, nothing uh, transforms a heart and a life like the grace and forgiveness of God. And I'm going to remind myself as we're about to learn that Christ is making his appeal through me whether that is to my husband, whether that is to my children, whether that is to myself, whether that is to the person standing in front of me who has a destiny that still needs to come to fruition. And I am going to be by the grace of the living God, the manifested grace, the mouth that blesses, the mouth that encourages, the mouth that does not yap about people's crud, and all the ways they're screwing up. And I'm going to remember the cross and I'm going to remember the manifested grace and forgiveness that I walk in and breathe in moment by moment from a pure and holy and mighty God. And by his grace, when I cannot, everybody say, I cannot. We're going to acknowledge that I cannot live this life of forgiveness and grace on my own in my flesh. I am going to get as dependent as I can. My husband's gonna do a dance and he doesn't even know it. And I am gonna look right in the grace that Jesus gives me and I'm gonna choose to forgive again. Everybody say again. And then when I'm really proud of myself that I did a great job in forgiving, I'm going to remind myself that that's not all Jesus did for me. He didn't just forgive me. He blessed me with every single thing in the spiritual realm that belongs to him. And I might do it gritting my teeth. And I might do it with all manner of words. Maybe nice, not nice. But I'm going to bless people. I'm going to ask God who they are beyond their brokenness. And I'm talking about people and I'm talking about organizations and I'm talking about entities and I'm talking about nations. I'm going to bless them because I carry the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ within my being and I am going to choose to appropriate it to advance the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of darkness. That's all I can give you. I'm in the journey with you. I'm in it. Choice by choice by choice by choice. And I have loved, I have loved journeying with you the last eight weeks. And I'm going to miss you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. So I want you to close your eyes. And I just want you for a moment, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you give us just a quick download, God. I'm asking for like a a movie reel for every person in our life. This will not be hard, it will not be comfortable either, but it will not be hard. I want you, Holy Spirit, to give us a reel of the level of forgiveness and grace that we've walked in in our life. I'm asking you, God, to show us picture after picture after picture where you have come and forgiven us. And my reel could be really long even this last week, and I am grateful. And as you sit there, church, and you hear and you see the level of forgiveness that has been lavished on you and currently is, and he has decided will forever, will forever be what you live under in Christ. I want you to hear the importance of the words of Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. But if 
you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. I want to remind you that the way that the kingdom of heaven was accessed by us, was appropriated to us, was because Christ forgave me. See, he chose in the way of the kingdom of God that forgiveness was gonna be the way that I was redeemed out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And it is true today that the way that I will abide in the kingdom of light is over and over and over again when I choose to forgive. Because in this life, many, many, you can open your eyes if you need to, many, 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 many will sin against me. It just will happen. But because of Christ and because of what he did at the cross, we are now given the empowerment to live above that sin, to go higher up into a greater kingdom reality, to appropriate the grace of God through our forgiveness, which is astonishing. What you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. What? What? that we actually get to partner with Christ in this way when he's the one that bought it is astounding. That we get to be the appropriators of grace with him when he paid all the cost. I don't even have words for that. But I sure don't wanna leave it untapped. The blood of Jesus cries out. So what about this forgiveness? There are some things that tries to block forgiveness in our mind. And one of them is we decide that we need, to bring, we need to be the justice bearer. I want to remind you that on the cross, Jesus paid the price and he satisfied the justice heart of God. He paid the debt for that sin. We do not have to demand it. We do not have to demand payment. I want you to know when Jesus comes back, we are living, we'll talk about this more in a minute, we're living in the grace time where he says to his people, "Draw, come on, I'm drawing all men to myself, be the living demonstration of my heart, be the living, living demonstration of grace and forgiveness on the earth so they'll be drawn to me, they'll hunger for me, they'll want me. And we get to be that, everybody say, I get to be that. <laughs> Except for that moment when I don't want to be that because you know how wrong what they did to me is. And that justice piece of us, it has to rise up because we're made in the image of God and that was just wrong, Shelly, do you understand? Some of us don't get back the wrong done to us. The cost is severe, the cost is great. Your God is greater. Your God is a restorer. Your God is a redeemer. Your God is able and willing. Are you willing when you cannot? Are you willing to join his willingness? Are you willing to join his capability to forgive? I'm asking you, I know you hit the wall. I hit the wall. I don't want to and I can't. But he is constantly able. And will you go up and will you lay down that offense and will you say, okay, come live your love, forgiveness, and grace through me? It's a choice. Only, you know, the flip side of it is, is a hard choice because if we don't choose that, other things happen. We either partner in grace and forgiveness or we partner with the kingdom of darkness. And forgiveness and bitter, unforgiveness and bitterness does a lot of things. But let's just say that in totality it leads to death and it robs from the fullness of restoration and redemption. Healing, the second thing we use our fleshly anger to, to try to make the impossible happen. Somehow we believe that revenge or somehow we believe that gossip or somehow we believe that a regurgitation of that pain over and over that was done to us is going to bring about our healing. I'm asking you, has it ever? 
never, and it will never. Why? Because there is one who bought the authority to heal, and his name is Jesus, and even if, so, we're gonna get to this in a minute, even if someone apologizes, they do not have the authority to heal the effects of sin. Only Jesus Christ has that authority. So you can draw from the empty well all you want of that person to make it okay, or you can draw from everyone else listening and validating, and oh, I'm so sorry, and oh, they're terrible, and let me take up your offense with you, and it will end up empty and dry and dead. That's what will happen because that's what unforgiveness does. It rots the soul. It rots the soul. So how do I know if I'm walking in bitterness and unforgiveness? Here's a few tangible ways. I mean, besides my attitude, you know, besides what's coming out of my mouth, I often replay in my mind the incidents that hurt me. When I think of a particular person, entity, or situation, I still feel very angry. I try hard not to think about that person, event, or circumstance that caused me so much pain. Just keep stuff in it. See how that works. I have a set, I'm telling you, see how that works. Your body starts being affected. Your mind starts being affected. Your spirit becomes affected. I have a subtle secret desire to see that person pay for what he or she did to me. Sometimes not so subtle. Deep in my heart, I wouldn't mind if something bad happened. I often find myself telling others how this person has hurt me. A lot of my conversations revolve around that situation. Anybody have toes stepped on yet? I do. Okay, I love you enough to step on him. He loves us enough to step on him. I'm telling you, if you have those situations happening, I just want to tell you there's good news. That situation wasn't supposed to happen to you. That person wasn't supposed to treat you that way. You, anger is not wrong. You're going to feel anger when Jesus, I mean, I mean, you're going to feel anger when people sin against you. How do I know that? Because the wrath of God was put on Jesus. What wrath was that? It was wrath against sin. There is a wrath that wells up in you. The greater the cost to you, the more angry you're going to be. The greater effect in your life, the, greater, the more angry you're going to be. And Jesus does not say, hey, by the way, don't feel angry. He says, in your anger, do not sin. He validates the feeling. He validates the hurt. He validates the cost like only he can. He validates the cost. And he invites you into what only he can invite you into. You see, we weren't supposed to come under that yoke of the weight of sin, not our own sin, you understand the yoke of your own sin, the weight. Anybody ever sinned? You ever feel that thing? I watch it in my little kids when they sin. It's like they want to hide. You know, they want to, mm, they don't want to talk. Intimacy instantly, instantly impeded. Right? That's what sin does. And then it's just burdensome. And sometimes I'll just wait. I don't wait long. I'm a go in kind of mom. But I will wait sometimes and ask because I know it's good for them to confess. But if they won't, I ask God for a dream. Sometimes he gives it. Or I ask for a situation. Why? Not because I want to catch him, because I want him free. I want him free from the burden of that. See, there is only one that has the capacity to carry the weight and the burden of sin, and that was Jesus, given to him by a visiting angel. He was he was sweating to the point of blood over, the, over the, aud the audaciousness of having to carry the weight of sin. And then the angel came. And the angel ministered to him. And in supernatural capacity given by God, he rose up, went to his disciples and said, let's go. My time has come. Resolutely set his heart towards Jerusalem, his face, and enter Palm Sunday. 
And a supernatural grace came upon him to do what we now can live in the freedom of. And that is live out from under the weight of sin. Not just our own, but the sin that others do to us. You understand, some of you live in it. You're crippled by it. It's exhausting. It's affected you your whole life. The sin that other people chose to do to us, whether that's direct sin or whether that's omission, sin through omission, what they didn't do that I really needed them to do. And Jesus carried the weight of all of it. Why in the world through unforgiveness do we wanna yoke ourselves to it again? He bought our freedom to not carry the crud that people do to us and the crud that I do. He bought it with his blood, he bought it with his heart, he bought it with his obedience. And it is his joy to give us the kingdom. We only need to partner with him in sowing to forgiveness and grace. You see, what happens here, and it's important that we understand this, is if we don't, if we do not forgive, then we're yoked. And every part of our life is forever affected. I wanna say this, when you sow to the kingdom of God in any area, you reap the kingdom. I don't know where you're gonna need it, y'all. I don't know if you sow to the kingdom in forgiveness because that's one of the ways of the kingdom. I don't know if you're gonna need physical healing. I don't know if you're gonna need generational breakthrough. I don't know what you're gonna need. But I can guarantee you because of the law of sowing and reaping, you sow to the kingdom of God, you're gonna reap the kingdom of God. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's in your physical healing, I don't know, but I, for one, am going to keep aligning with the kingdom of light, and this is a major way that I know I can do it. I can forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and give grace. I wanna say one thing before I get into the grace cycle. This is really important, and it's really, really sticky, so I need you to stay with me, okay? There are times when people continue to walk in rebellion, intentional, willful rebellion, and that sin begins to affect you and there is no willingness for repentance to happen. There are times that there needs to be a boundary drawn where you are not perpetually under someone's willful sin and the effects of that willful sin. There are also times that someone who's walking in sin does not see that yet, does not understand what they're doing, and you may need to be, draw your boundary and intercede and pray for them. There may be times when you think someone's walking in willful sin and you have decided that they're doing things intentionally, that your own brokenness is in the way, and you still may need to draw a boundary until God does a greater healing work in you. But either way, there are times in our walk with God as we begin the journey of forgiveness and grace, we have to pay attention to boundaries so that God can do his effectual work in me, God can do his effectual work in them. But what we do not have an option for is where our heart posture lands towards that person, that organization. We have to do whatever it takes to get our heart to a loving posture towards that person because that is how Jesus operates with us and that is the kingdom. So I tell my kids, boundary yourself as far back as you need to, baby, but you're gonna love. We're not staying in hate, bitterness, and anger. We're not. We're gonna go as far back as we need to to get as much healing as we can to, and wait on the Holy Spirit and we're gonna go back in as far as we need to for the redemption of God to occur. But we're gonna follow the Spirit all the way through. Is this clear? Okay, but one of the, one of the things we do often is go, well, I'm drawing my boundary. And that means I can relive this, curse them, talk about them, gossip about them, slander. I'm just saying no. Because the law of sowing and reaping is still at play even if someone sins. 
So you be careful what you do with someone's sin because he did something with your sin. And it was not anything except moving it towards grace and redemption. And he still sits at the right hand of the Father with your brokenness and my sin and pleads mercy over us. So if your heart is not there towards that person, however boundary do you have to get, you have to get your heart there. Because if you don't, you are not forgiven. And if you don't, you reap the consequences. I'm going to read a couple of these. Matthew 7, 1 through 12. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Anybody like that as little as I do? Okay, just asking. Then Romans 2 goes further. I want to tear Romans 2, 1 out of the Bible. I can't. You therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. I told you I wanted to tear it out. I forewarned you. Here's the thing. In the kingdom of light, I'm just going to use these for example, okay? There is love. There is truth. That standard of righteousness that God does not, he does not, um, he doesn't change it for you or anyone else. He set that standard of truth and righteousness on purpose. Then he comes, and this is how he operates, in forgiveness. He chose that that's the way he's going to redeem us. All right? And then he didn't stop there. He poured out mercy. We deserved death. And he withheld death from us. You understand this. Our sin deserved death. He said, no, I'm stopping death. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just give us mercy. He gave us grace. The unmerited favor of God where he stops and says, not only am I going to forgive you, not only is death not going to consume you, I mean, is sin not going to consume you and kill you, I am going to go further and I am going to give you grace. I am going to bring you up and every single thing the Father has given me, I'm going to give you and you get to operate in it. He constantly blesses us. And he's constantly bringing life to us. That is the kingdom of light. Over here in the kingdom of darkness, let me tell you how it works. It's not fun. And it ultimately, I'm not going to belittle it at all, leads to death. And that's exactly what he wants. So here's how this works. He hates people, you included. This is not a small hate. This is an utter hatred that wants to see you dead. Everybody understand that? He lies, constantly lies. I've told you some of this in the kingdom, in the kingdom teaching. Unforgiveness and bitterness is his plan because it keeps you bound to the sin you do and, uh, and what others have done to you, okay? The bitter root that grows up, the bitter root that grows up defiles many. So, you know, he loves that. He gets to have sin come against you and then obliterate everyone else with you. This is his lovely plan through gossip and slander. Okay, so here starts the cycle of accusation, judgment, and condemnation. Now, here's what we love to do as believers. We love to join right here in accusation, judgment, and condemnation. And we love to try to say that it's going to bring us life. It doesn't. You don't get to flip kingdoms just because you're in the mood that day or just because you decide you need to become judge that day. Do you remember that Holy Spirit says, I am the one who convicts of sin and, everybody say and, and convinces of righteousness. I do both. 
that doesn't leave much room of need for you outside of loving. Amen. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, this is not neat like I like it to be. Okay, then constantly in the kingdom of darkness, the enemy is cursing us. He stands before God night and day accusing the brethren. He, he brings us into judgment where he says that's who you are. Not just you're doing something wrong, but now this is who you are. And then he goes further and says it's who you'll always be. You're never going to be able to change. Have you ever done this with anybody? Just asking. Have you ever decided that, um, that what they did is really unforgivable or you're just really not in the mood, whichever one? Um, and I do distinguish between those. Because some of you that have been through the atrocities you've been through, it feels very unforgivable. It feels like the robbing was too much. It feels like the restoration is impossible. And for others of us, we can't even get over, you know, somebody's bad mood for the day. Right? Why do y'all all laugh? Because you know it's true. Because I'm just not in the mood to give you grace today. Okay? But here's how it works. The enemy comes, he hates you, he lies to you, he chooses to constantly accuse you, and then he judges you and says, it's not just your behavior, but it's who you are. And then he says, it's who you'll always be. And we join the camp when people sin against us, y'all. Which one? When the kids were little, we'd make them wave red flags. When they got offended by someone's sin, and they, uh, they were so annoyed by it, y'all. Why do we have to go get the flags? Because you're about to make a very important choice. It's a very important choice. Your relational dynamics depend on it, whether you know that at three or not. The more unforgiveness, the more you get offended with someone, the more unforgiveness builds, your relationship is going to begin to obliterate. And I'm not having that in my home. You need each other after your dad and I are gone. You need each other. And I am going to make sure that you sow to the right kingdom. And even if it's, I forgive you. Right? We'll work on that. You're three. They're three. Why am I still stuck at three sometimes? I don't know, but I am. I forgive. Right? Okay, so then, you know, the accuser comes and says, they're in your mind, they're never going to change. No, they didn't just do something wrong. That's who they are. How many of you would like to be judged as who the totality of you are based on your few behaviors or your stuck place in your life? I would not. I would not. And Jesus doesn't see me that way, okay? And condemnation says, you're always gonna be that way. Gauntlet down, judgment, I mean, condemnation rendered, boom. Never happening. And then guaranteed, you're gonna start speaking it out of your mouth. You can try not to, but I'm telling you, you go down this slippery slope long enough, it's gonna come out of your mouth to somebody. They are so, well, I mean, have you ever, did you ever notice this about them? Yeah. Well, I mean, pray about this with me. My little nice little platform, step up in my judgment and spew and defile many. Okay, then there's death. It always leads to death. Death of yourself, death of relationship, death of health, death of, of emotional health. What if with what Jesus brought us, we were able to love somebody who sinned against us? Oh! <gasps> Shock, church, that we are empowered by the King of Kings to when we are offended, choose to love. Truth, I am not telling you keep stuffing, keep ignoring people's brokenness. I'm saying love them enough to go in and speak the truth. It's not loving to let someone who you habitually see, 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 living in ways that's destructive to them to just keep your mouth shut and avoid conflict. That is not who we are. That's not what Jesus did. He went to the cross. He faced the enemy. He said, you're not going to get to keep doing that to my people. Sin is a big deal. So you have to go in love. Everybody say in love. 
in love and speak the truth and say, I could be wrong here, go in humility, but this seems to be a pattern and I'm in love bringing it to you for you and the Holy Spirit to look at. And maybe your people that you trust. Do you hear me? I'm not saying never mind sin. I'm not saying that. Forgiveness, after we've done, after we've loved, and we choose to forgive, then we get to give mercy and we say, God, don't let death come to me or to them through this. Would you please bless them with something from heaven that's in the kingdom of light that will help heal them, help deliver them, help bless them, help them see the truth so they can get in operation and I'm in. I'm in, I'm gonna love whatever that looks like. I might be loving from my closet because I need the boundary there, but I am gonna love. Or I might be right there with you, arm in arm, step by step. I'm not leaving you till this thing is gone in your life. And I will be a faithful friend and I will be the one speaking life over you and I will remind you who you are apart from this sin. And I'm in because that's what it takes because we carry each other's burdens. And I'm gonna bless you till you're sick of it. My kids are so sick of blessing. Come here, let me bless you. I got 18 short years, people. I gotta get all of it in. I'm kidding, I'll keep blessing them. I mean, when they're old, I'll probably be the mom calling, hey, babe, I just wanna bless you. I can just see them. I don't care. They're gonna love it. They're gonna be the most blessed kids alive. And it always, always, always leads to life. And you don't get to hop over, y'all. You don't get to hop over just because it feels good to your flesh to sit right here. You make your choice. You take your stand and you watch God move. But I am telling you, he only blesses this. He does not, the spirit of God does not come here. Doesn't happen. When you are offended with someone's by someone's sin, maybe even your own, See, a lot of you are highly offended with yourself and your choices. I'm asking you, when does Jesus' blood become enough for you? When do you get to stop accusing yourself? When do you get to stop judging yourself? When do you get to stop um, um, condemning yourself? And when do you get to stop speaking word curses over yourself? I'm so, I'll never, I'll always be. Shut up in love, shut up. Just stop. If you're going to get there, stop. And say something different. We'll get there. When you're offended by someone's sin, you must forgive. If you are a believer and you want the manifestation of the kingdom of God in your life, you have to forgive. You don't get a vote. Because if you choose the other, death is coming. And y'all, we give ourselves days, hours, months, years, lifetimes, waiting on the crux of this choice, thinking there's a fence and there isn't one. There is no fence. You are either in one kingdom or you are in the other. And as long as you're contemplating and waiting on forgiving, you're in bitterness and you're in unforgiveness. This has saved me to realize there's no fence because I've just decided why give him another hour? Why give him another day? If I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna forgive, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it now because I don't have time for you, enemy. I don't. If I'm gonna do it tomorrow, I might as well do it right now. Right? Seriously. Okay, if you're struggling to forgive, how many of you ever struggle to forgive? You better have your hand up now. Okay, now, um, if you... (laughs) If you struggle to forgive ever, then I want to encourage you, there is an anecdote for the ability to forgive. Typically, because we're made in the image of God, somewhere in there, we have some compassion in us, somewhere, right? For us, some of us, it's more evident than others, okay? But we do, some of us carry greater measure of truth and justice, and some of us carry greater measures of love and compassion, it's all important. Okay, so if you're offended and you're struggling to forgive, I encourage you to go up and encounter God with your pain and your offense. I'm asking you, stop trying in your own 
well, it might. Stop trying in your own power to go dig from that empty well of yourself and start digging to the well of Jesus Christ who has all that you need and is willing to give it. You just haven't gone to access it and ask for it. He wants you to bring your pain and he wants you to say, this is the worst pain I've ever had and you have to come and you have to heal me. Because if you don't, I'm gonna keep trying to get it from them. And in case you didn't, couldn't tell God, they don't care very much. I mean, it would be awesome if we could go with our pain to people, and we should, and they would just say, oh, I'm so sorry. I care so much that I hurt you. Is that always the way your boss is going to react? No. They're gonna be like, what's your problem? I didn't do that. I would, well, you got a problem, right? I mean, most of the time. So we want to encounter God with our pain. We want to encounter God with our pain. And we want him to speak. We want to say, God, where were you? What were you saying? What were you doing when this happened to me? And what do you have to say about it? I'm telling you guys, when I've done this, I don't care what anyone says to me. They can't meet me like God meets me. They can't. And man, because he comes and he loves you and you are it to him, he is going to sit with you as long as it takes till that place is healed. I am telling you, y'all, there is a rebellion and people will not do this. I don't understand it. But they just will not humble themselves enough to say, I need healing. I need this pain met. They won't honor themselves enough. They won't put the same honor that the blood of Jesus put on, on your pain from other people's sin. See, when Jesus went to hell and he and he took over and he said, do you understand? He, gave, he took iniquity. He took your infirmity. He took all the plans of the devil and he obliterated them. And I just imagine him going, thank you for the keys. You don't get access for those who belong to me you, through sin. You no longer get to oppress them, not from their own sin and not from other people's sin. Your day is over. Thank you. I hold the key. And when they access me, they access healing from any and all sin. He conquered sin, not just yours, all sin. And he paid for it, and he paid for the ability for it to be re restoration to happen, redemption to happen, and victory to happen in your life. So we can go up and we can be healed by this great king of kings with all authority to heal. It's a little easier to forgive then, y'all. And we wanna come and we wanna break any judgments we've made. 99.999% of the time, when you are hurt from someone's sin or when you hurt yourself with your own sin, there's gonna be a judgment attached to it that you're deciding that that's who they are, right? Like, I don't know why we're wired that way, but we just are. So we have a little bit harder time going, oh, well, that was just a one-time statement. I'm sure he didn't mean that. Nope. Usually we're like, well, they're out. You know, or gosh, I thought he was. Now I know how he really is. You know, nobody can have a bad day. We just make a judgment on him. Well, we already told you what judgments do, so we want to break judgments. Jesus does not constantly sit up, accuse, and judge us. He's constantly telling us and reminding us who we are in God so that we can throw off sin. He's the one saying, I know what you did, baby girl, but we got this. Come on, get up. I'm going to wash you off, dust you off, bless you, and we're going to keep going. You're getting out of that. Right? right? That's what he does. That's who he is. He's really happy and he's really free. Jesus is very happy and he's very free. And he's in you and you can be really happy and really free as long as you don't judge people. So if you judge people, it becomes messy. Here we go. This one. And then we're gonna, we're winding down just so you guys know. We're about to do something really quick. When you come and let's just say there's no repentance. Ever had that in your life? Somebody sin against you, they don't repent? Okay. Um, what we wanna do when people don't repent, we may need boundaries. I'm okay with that as long as my heart's pure and in conjunction with heaven with its purposes towards them. But we wanna go up and ask, who are they? 
I see what's happening. I see what they're doing. I understand the brokenness if I'm right, if I'm always right, which I am. <laughs> then, you know, um, Lord, who are they? This obviously is not who they were made to be. There's obviously some brokenness, some hurt, some sin there. Who are they? And listen for heaven's declaration over that person. Listen, because he'll be happy to tell you the angels are all in agreement. Heaven's in agreement. The Trinity's in agreement. He would like for someone on the earth to get in agreement and start speaking it and praying it. It would really help matters. He'll do it without you, but he would love for you to get to be involved. When you get there, this is where we kick the enemy's tail. This is where we bring heaven to earth. This is where we halt the enemy's work in our own life. See, he can't not forgive us and he can't make judgments on us when we've broken it. This is cleansing the spiritual atmosphere. Get it clean, people. Do it fast. But right here is where we, as the people of God, with the authority of God and Jesus Christ in us, get to bring heaven to earth. And we say, God, who are they? Who are they in you? And then they're gonna bless. We're gonna finish in Mark 11. It's funny that this is the scripture of today. Jesus is entering the triumphal entry. And he comes in, just like he says, the king is here, the battle's on, war is waging, he's winning. Jesus does something the following day, curses the fig tree. He wants something to eat, it's not that season. And he just says out of his mouth, may you never bear fruit again. You know what happens then? Yes. They come to Jerusalem, they enter the temple, they drive out people. He makes a declaration as to how his house is going to operate. And they pass by the next morning and they saw the fig tree withered at its roots. Shock. What Jesus said manifests and happens. And Peter remembered. He said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says that this mountain be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is also in heaven will forgive your trespasses. Y'all, this is the kingdom coming right here. He prioritizes forgiveness. He tells you this is the way. And I'm telling you, when you forgive, all of heaven backs you. Nothing hinders your prayers when this spiritual atmosphere is clean. Nothing. You can command anything in generational lines. You can command anything on your boss. You can command any in Christ. And you look at me like I'm crazy. I just read the word. Jesus Christ is in you. What you curse is cursed, y'all. Be careful. He's teaching his disciples. What I say has power and Christ dwells in you. And what you say matters. Get this thing in alignment. Because this is where we war in a way that Satan cannot touch us. He has no weapon against love. He has no weapon against agreement in the kingdom of God. When you bless something, it is blessed. Don't let the enemy come and say, well, yeah, look what all your blessings is from all your judgments. Who cares? It's not, you're not blessing them with your judgments. You're saying, if they're being selfish, you're saying, God, give them the joy of operating in selflessness. God, give them the joy of operating in patience, not rage. God, give them the joy. What do you want to bless them with? All of heaven is open. Go for it. When your heart is to bless, pick anything, everything, just bless them. Just remember that you're changing people's lives. You're changing spiritual atmospheres. You're, by faith, you're changing what is able to come upon them from heaven. I want you, everybody, to take out your grace cycle. I want you to look at it. We're going to do it. Y'all like, oh, crud. 
I know you've been thinking about who you're offended at. Or maybe you've been trying to avoid it, remember? I want you to think of someone you're offended with. And before you go to, okay, just, I've been convinced we're just gonna go ahead and forgive because I want life in that place in my heart and my mind. I want you to go up for a minute and I want you to tell God how you feel. I want you to tell him how you feel about that. I want you to tell him what you need healed. I want you to tell him what validation and justice you would like. Just remember when you're telling him that you reap what you sow. And I want you to move and make that willful choice to forgive. And if you struggle, I want you to come under the grace and the ease of letting Jesus do it through you. I want you to literally imagine, okay, God, I yield my will over. I can't. But I give you permission to come through me with your great love and your great mercy and forgive through me. I just let you go. I, I align my will. Let it happen. Flow, spirit, flow. And then I want you to ask Jesus right now, is there any judgment I've made on that person? Remember, you become that very thing. Remember that you reap a whirlwind when you judge. Remember that you become the thing you judge. That's the word. And I want you to break that thing. I just want you to say, Jesus, I break the judgment over this person that they're this. I just break it by the blood right now. And I want you to tell me, God, who are they? Who am I? Maybe you're doing this over yourself. Who am I in this place? And then I want you in your heart before God, I want you to go straight up to God, look him in the eyes, right there with Jesus who gives you access and I want you to bless them. Just start blessing them. And know that in your lifetime, you will receive a blessing. <clears throat> Lord, I pray right now that we would get it as the body, that you've given us authority on the earth to bring the kingdom here. Father, I thank you. I thank you for sending Jesus and I want you to look at me, church. Right now, we are where we are, and in time, that could be tonight, tomorrow, the next hour, or generations, I don't know. But I'm telling you, however it looks for the church, the time is short, that grace can come. Because when Jesus comes back, every sin not repented of not under the blood, is gonna come under the wrath of God. So you don't have to worry about this justice deal. If it wasn't repented of, you'll wish it had been. Or you can right now join God and say, I choose, as for me, I choose grace, I choose mercy, I choose to forgive. But we have a very short time between now and when Jesus returns to live the gospel daily in such a way in our life that love is the pervasive realm. Love conquered hell and we get to sow it and we get to partner and we get to see the victory when heaven begins to change you, me, people, churches, cities and nations and it is your destiny and i bless you to walk in it in jesus name